Hello, everybody. Let me get to the title screen here. Today we will be talking about citing your sources. It can be fun and useful. Useful probably more than fun, but it is incredibly important if you're going to do any kind of genealogy or family history research. Now I could probably spend the next three or four hours going through sources and citations, and we still wouldn't cover everything. But what I wanted to do was give you an introduction on how to construct a few, how to enter them into maybe Family Tree Maker, how to use them to analyze evidence, and then give you some pointers on where to look next. I'm really excited. I think we have almost 140 viewers. I'm just so excited that people care this much. You will do a much better job at uncovering your family history if you understand sources and what they mean and what they're used for. All right, so let's get started. Citing your sources. Why should you cite your sources? There are two main reasons why you should do this. It's not so you can look smart to other people. It's so you can find the source again if you need it. If you talk to anybody who's been doing this a while, they'll tell you sad stories, myself included, of evidence and information they found that helped them prove something, but they didn't make a copy, they didn't cite their source, and then they can never find it again. It's out there, but they can't find it. Even if your source is not perfect, even if it's just a note on what book you found it in, or a URL, record something so you can go back there and find it again. You can always clean up your citation and make it pretty later, but write down something. You will save yourself a lot of grief. And you also want to be able to evaluate the quality of the source when you have conflicting evidence. Or, even, or when you're looking at somebody else's tree. If someone has no source, you don't know where that information came from. It may be excellent information, but you don't know. You don't know if it's valid. And if your source is somebody else's family tree, let's say you're proving a birth date, and then you've got another source, which is an actual birth certificate, you can quickly look at those and decide which one you think is the better source and therefore the better information. When you're trying to make decisions, because there's lots of conflicting evidence out there, because the documents we look at were not really intended for genealogical purposes. They weren't written that way. So we have to make a lot of decisions. So this is why you do this, to find it again and to evaluate the quality. Family history is not about finding records to attach to your family tree. And too often we get into this thing. It's like, hey, yeah, it's great. We, you know, we attach, we attach, we attach, we do searches, we attach, we attach, we attach. That is not the purpose here. We want to be able to determine kinship between people and understand their identity. We want to be able to tell their story. If you don't tell your ancestor's story and tell it as accurately as you can, it's very likely no one will. They'll be forgotten in time. You make these people alive. You keep their memories alive. What you do is really important. So genealogy is about what you do with the records after you find them. All right. If you're going to get serious about this, even a little bit serious about this, and you ask anybody who's done any kind of genealogy, they will tell you this. The best reference for citing and sourcing evidence is evidence explained by Elizabeth Schoen Mills. If you ever go to a conference and you have a chance to hear her talk, do it. It will be an hour well spent. She's amazing. One of the great things about this book now, the book is about an inch and a half thick and it weighs a lot and I hate dragging it around, but you can now purchase a downloadable copy at her new site. Let me show you real quick. And again, she has no affiliation with Ancestry, uh, but this book is important. This is the one that you want to have. And I put the um, URL over there, and I'll go back to it in a second. But if you go to www.evidenceexplained.com and then to the bookstore, you'll find it. Now, if you download this, and it's only $27.95. That's pretty cheap when you think about how much we spend on genealogy. You can get this book, it's downloadable, it's in PDF, you can search it, it's awesome. You can download it on three different devices. If you're at all serious about this, even mildly serious about this, this will be money well invested. Plus she does a lot of things that she explains in there that you'll find really useful. You can also buy some of the quick sheets. There's one for um, all sorts of things. There's one specifically about, it's 
got to be in here. There it is. The Ancestry one, citing online historical resources. If you're at a conference, you can usually pick these up for eight bucks. You can or nine bucks. You can buy them here. Again, but if you get the book, you're pretty much golden. And this has rules on everything. You can also go to her site, and she has a message board. People will answer questions there. You'll also find in the genealogy community, if you have questions on how to write sources and somebody knows what they're talking about, they will be more than happy to help you write your sources and give you advice on how to do it. People get so excited when it, people start taking this seriously. Help is out there. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. And again, there's the URL. So what do you do when you get a record? First, you examine the actual record. Well, hold on. There's one other thing I wanted to show you. Sorry about that. Let's go back to Elizabeth Shemnell's book. And let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger for you. Oh, it doesn't want me to do that. There we go. This is her diagram of evidence analysis. And this is from her book. I think it's like on page three or something. So this is all her um, credit where credit is due. Evidence analysis, a process map. The basic principle, when you're trying to figure out things, sources provide information. So the book, the database, you know, a collection of birth certificates, whatever. That's the source. It provides information. From this information, we select evidence for analysis. So depending on the question you ask, you may have a bunch of census records. That's information. But you may ask questions like, when was so-and-so born? Who did they marry? And then that becomes specific evidence to help you answer that question. Once you do look at a lot of information from a lot of different sources and do an exhaustive search, you can draw conclusions that may then be considered proof. And it's the quality of your sources that help you determine if this is a valid conclusion. All right. Let's see here. Now that is not what I wanted to do. There we go. So what do you do when you get a record? You examine the actual record if you can. An index of a bunch of birth certificates is okay. The actual birth certificate is better. And then you have to ask yourself, what was the purpose of this record? Who supplied the information? And then write down what you learned. Well, think about a census record. And this is where a source is so important. So if you know it's a census record, you know it's a population schedule. It was used to enumerate the number of people in a district so that they could determine how many Congress people to allocate. This was not done for genealogical purposes. It was not determined to, it was not recorded to determine how old people were accurately, though they tried their best, so you have to keep that in mind. So once you get all that stuff, then you should write a citation for a record, because you need to be able to find it again, and you need to be able to evaluate the validity of the information. Even if your citation is far from perfect, and trust me, I got a lot of far from perfect citations out there. If I can find it again, and I can at least tell enough about it so I can evaluate the validity of the information, that's okay. If I decide to publish, if I decide to put in my blog, if I decide to write a paper, whatever, I can go back and clean it up later and get it perfect. But this is how at least I can do these two things. So let's look at an example, and I'm going to show you how to write some citations. And then we can also look at how you put those in Family Tree Maker. All right, so let's look at an example. This is my great-great-grandfather, Jeremiah Gillespie. When was he born? What documentation do I have? I have the 1850 census through the 1880 census. I have a marriage record and I have my family Bible. And you might look at this and go, well, you got the family Bible. You're good. There you go. You're done. Not so fast. All right. So we discussed how sources and all these things here are sources. And then there's information that I'm going to use to supply as evidence to answer the question when Jeremiah was born. So out of all these sources, these are all the possible birth dates that I have for Jeremiah. And I've written all these sources out, and I'll go back through them here in a little bit. But there's the 1850 census, 1860, 1870, 1880. These are all censuses. I know that these could be accurate. We hope they're accurate, but they may not be. And they give me dates of 
from 1827, 1826. Those are all fairly close, which is nice, but that doesn't mean they're right. And then 1820, which is a nice little outlier there. Also, the, in the Virginia Marriages, which is a database, and I didn't see the actual marriage certificate or marriage entry in the register, which is much more likely given the date of the marriage, which is 1848. There's no data about how old he was, so I can't use that to display evidence. But here's where a source is really important. In this Gillespie family Bible, his birth date is written out as March 4th, 1826. Great, it's family Bible, probably right, right? But let's look at the uh, citation here. Gillespie Family Bible, it's the Holy Bible, published in New York in 1857. So what does that tell you? If this Bible was published in 1857, the earliest the family could have purchased it was 1857. My great-great-grandfather was born in 1826. This information was not written down when he was born. It was written down almost, what, 30 years later. Now, you'll notice that I have a sentence in here. The sons of Tartan Mahal and Gillespie, those are his parents, are listed with their birth dates. It appears they were all written in one time and are dated April 20th, 1860. So that gives me information to assess how useful this actual citation is. Now, it's probably better information when you look up and down this chart because it was probably supplied by somebody who actually knew him. It has all the brothers listed. None of the daughters, by the way, just the brothers. It has all of the brothers listed. And it was probably written by somebody who knew them, right? So this is really the best evidence I've got for when his actual birth date was. And for now, that's what I'm going with. I'm not done an exhaustive search. There may be more evidence that comes up later that changes my conclusion. But based on what I've got, and looking at these sources, it seems to me, and you may draw a different conclusion, but this seems to me this is the best guess as to when he was born. This is why sourcing is so important. It helps you not just guess, but make educated guesses when there is no perfect evidence. And sometimes actual evidence that you think is right may be wrong, so you just never know. All right, so let's go back and look how we wrote these sources. All right, and this is the slide where I talk about which one was right. And again, none of the evidence has an identified informant. And this is really important when you look at sources. Figure out who, and who supplied that information. And none of those sources tell us who it was. None was recorded as his birth, so none of it was direct evidence from the time of his birth. And then we think the Bible is the most likely one. All right, let's get into the nuts and bolts. And I'm just going to go through each of these. And this can be a little bit... All right, it's not the most exciting thing I've ever talked about. And if you like, if, there's, if people would like to see this, I could post it on my Ask Ancestry and column. And we could... And I'm only going to go through the censuses and the ones I have here. There's just, you know, hundreds of different things that we could cite. And I'd be more than happy to answer those questions in the column. But let's start here. So... What I do is I make templates for um, sources that I use often. Then I can cut and paste the template. I can put it in my blog. I can put it in a paper. I can put it in Family Tree Maker. I can put it online. Wherever I want to put it, I can do that. I just put these in words and I, you know, use the caps here so I know what kind of information goes there. This is how you cite the 1850 census. It's the 1850 U.S. Census. I, I have a county name. I have a state name. It's a population schedule. This defines what type of document it is. Then the city or district. You know how sometimes, and this is in 1850 through 1870, it'll say, in this case, it's Amherst County, Virginia, and then Eastern District. You don't put that up there in the location the page, and whether it's stamped or pinned. When you go and you look at the actual <clears throat> Excuse me. When you go and you look at the actual images, you'll notice that sometimes the page number is stamped and sometimes it's pinned. And sometimes there's both, so put both. The dwelling number, the family number, person or people. Then you put Ancestry.com in italics. You put the URL, and you can put a specific URL, but I usually just go with the site. It depends on what you want to do. When it was accessed. In case that document ever goes away, if you put the date it was accessed, at least you know when it was there. 
digital images because I'm looking at the actual images. These are NARA, the National Archives, and these are microfilm. They're microfilm publications. And I've got the microfilm publications all here for you. So for 1850, it's MR4432. And you can do a search on NARA M432, and I'll bring up a book that explains a lot of things to you. Now, these were all microfilm from 1790 to 1930, so they all have roll numbers which identify the role of the microfilm. So if you were to go to NARA or the Family History Library, you could actually pull the microfilm and look at it. 1940 does not have a micro a roll number because those were all digital images. It took me forever to figure that out one day, but now you know. All right, so I take this and I fill in all the blanks. See, if you've got a format, it's pretty easy. This one did not have an actual page number on it. So I wasn't really quite sure what to do and I'm by no means an expert on how you source everything. So I just put in FURD because it was one of those things where there's two pages, the other side has 96, this side did not. So I just put 96 in FURD. And that way, when I go back and look at this, I know that it didn't actually have the number on it, but from the surrounding evidence, I assume that was the page number. The dwelling number, the family number, I put the name as it was indexed on the image. Digital images, Ancestry.com, I accessed it yesterday, and I'm citing NARA microfilm publication M4432, roll 933. So, anybody sees this, they're going to know exactly where I was looking at and how to go find it again if they wanted to analyze the data themselves. All right. <clears throat> so, let's look at how you might actually get this into Family Tree Maker. There are a lot of ways you can do this, and I guarantee you, everybody is going to have their own way to do this. This is how I do it. I like to have templates that I keep in Word documents so that I can paste them in a lot of places when I get them updated. <clears throat> so I don't use all of the things that you might see let me make this a little bit bigger, that you might see um, all the little template -y things they do in, in um, Family Tree Maker. All right, so you cannot see this because it's really, really small. But here in Family Tree Maker, where that green line is, is the record for the 1850 census. And if you're all experienced with um, Family Tree Maker, you know over here is the source. So what you can do, when you merge this in, it's going to have a bunch of stuff in there that, it's better than nothing, I'll leave it that way. I'm not going to make editorial comments. So let's say this, you're doing this for the very, very first time. Now this one I've got, and it's all accurate, which is nice because I went through and I did it. But let me show you how you might do it from the start. The very first thing that you want to appear in this census information is the actual source, which is the 1850 U.S. Census. I think actually I probably ought to have federal in there. But, so, let's pretend we're doing it all over from new. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click new. I don't think this gets, oh, it does get bigger. Nice. All right. So it's going to have a source template, and I can leave it blank for default. I'm doing my own templates, so I'm going to leave it blank. But you have to have a title of the source. And the title of the source is 1850 U.S. Whoops, Federal Census. That's all I'm going to put. Nothing else. You can fill in that stuff. You can do all that stuff if you want to. The more you play with this, you'll get used to it on your own. But because I publish in a lot of different places, not just on Family Tree Maker, I do it on the Ancestry.com blog. I do it on my own blog. I'm starting to write papers as I try and get it, my CG. I do them in a bunch of different places, so I do them on my own. All right, so I will then click OK. And then in where it says Citation Detail, I go over to my Word document. I'm going to bring that over. And I do the ever-popular cut and paste, and I paste it in. I'm all happy. Oops, I don't want to cancel. I paste it in. It's there. Then I say OK. And then if I mouse over that, it tells me what 
the citation is. Now, if I publish anything, like if I if I publish a, you know, using publish here on Family Tree Maker, that's what the citation will look like, and it should be correct, and somebody else can find it. All right. So, and again, it just takes practice to get these things in in the way you would like these to be. All right. So, let's go back and go through the rest of these real quickly. The censuses are all sort of, you know, pretty much the same. 1860, very similar. In fact, I think this is all the same. We do not currently have the roll numbers in our source information on 1860, so I just left this in my citation as roll RRR. I will, I'm going to go work with somebody and see if we can't get those on there. I don't know why they got left off. They should be on there. 1870, very much the same, county name, state name, population schedule, dwelling, family, etc. If you're doing a family or you have more than one person, and in this example I don't, but you could say Jeremiah and Mary Gillespie, if that made more sense. On 1880, this one is a little bit different because then they started with enumeration districts, and this is where you put this in. City so or district, enumeration district, the number and the page. On this particular one, that's enumeration district 19. On the page, there are two page numbers on this. I have a stamped one, 215A, and I have a pinned one, which was 13, so I put them both on there. It's up to you. Dwelling, 118, family 115. It's listed as Jesse Gillespie, and that one was really hard to find. This one is T9 and not an M, and there's the roll number. Family Bible. And this will work for anything which you privately hold, all right? So if it's like a deed you privately hold or something like that, you can use the same basic format. The original owner and dates. I didn't have the dates in this one, so I didn't include them. The Bible name. Then in parentheses, the publication place, the publisher, the year. Then the page or section current or last owner, owner's location, your owned, and a descriptive detail if you so desire. So, my source is the Gillespie Family Bible. This thing is so cool. It's been in the family since um, before 1860. I, it's one of my prized possessions. The title of it is the Holy Bible. It was published in New York, as we discussed before, in 1857. The section that I quoted from was Family Records Births, page 840 privately held by me. I usually don't put my address publicly, but I live in California and I, have, I currently own it in 2012. And then I have the description. Okay. And I'm looking at somebody making the comment. Uh, Marie, your question is, is she saying that the sourcing that Ancestry.com does when you save a document in FTM is not any good? No. I'm not saying that, but here's what I am saying. I'm saying that, and yes, by the way, we all did get kicked out and we're all logging back in. What I'm saying is there are different ways to source anything. Thomas Jones, who is also another authority on sourcing, when you, and I, he, was, he taught me sourcing when I took the Boston University class, said, you, you know, you ask him, okay, what is the one right way to do this kind of document? And his answer is always, it depends because you just, it depends on what it is you're trying to get across. Now, usually what Ancestry sources things, and Family Search does this as well, there's a couple ways you can do the sources. You can emphasize where you found it, and then the actual contents of it, like you found it on Ancestry, and here's it, it is the 1850 census. Or you can say, here's the actual source, which was the 1850 census, and I found it on Ancestry. What is it that you're trying to get across? For me, I am always trying to get across the actual source of where it was recorded. So that's what I always put first. That's not what Ancestry chooses to do, so I just overwrite it. But the information is there. And if you're attaching records and you're not going to go back and, you know, look at some of the stuff, it's perfectly fine that you can leave it there. But if you're really trying to figure some things out, if you're trying to get something written up that you want to show to somebody, you might want to change it up a little bit and make it emphasize where the information came from, not so much that it all came from Ancestry. I hope that makes sense. 
I saw a question on there about what about a photo of a headstone. I do not have that in here. We can do other things like those later. Okay. Another question. Does the source from ancestry not transfer over to family tree maker? Yes. When you sink your tree back and forth, they do go back and forth. All right, here's the marriage index. And marriage index is, um, this is an index. It is not the actual marriage record. So you want to make sure that you get that across. So the basic format, and this would be like birth index, death index, marriage index, all that kind of thing. Database name, database. The word database says that it's a database. You could also put index in there if you, if you felt that was more descriptive. Ancestry.com, the date accessed, entry for person, event date, event location, and citing the source. So this came from Virginia Marriages. It's a database, Ancestry.com, the date I got it, and then it was an entry for Jeremiah Gillespie and Mary E. Gillespie. Yes, they were first cousins, my family tree twist, and it's not the only place. The date was 21st of November, 1848. It was in Amherst, Virginia. And then this particular collection cites, and then I put all that information in there. Now, what I really need to do, if I want to go find out more information about their marriage, I have to go find the marriage register, register if it still exists and look that up. But for now, this is what I've got. And this gives me the ability to go and find it later, right? This helps you keep track of where you are. Now, let's go over and look at the live site here for a second. Yes, okay. So this is Jeremiah Gillespie and I synced it back and forth. Um, let me, because I can show you and I think this is sort of cool. This right here, I'm gonna show you how hard this is to read. This is the family Bible page and it's just an amazingly cool thing. This thing is so hard to read, but if you write in here, it says Jeremiah Gillespie. And what's fascinating about this particular page, it really does appear they were all written at the same time, but the surname is spelled differently on the page. I think it's crazy. And then down here it says April 20th, 18, I think that says 1860. So that's the actual page. All right, detour. So if I go over here to the person overview page for Jeremiah, you'll notice over here, now what I've got is I've got five source, source citations for birth. And if I go and I click here on the actual event, which is birth, you'll see up here facts and events and another little tab that says source citations. And you can go look at anybody's tree and check out their sources. And then it will list all of the source citations. And then you can take a look at them and get a, you know, if you see something like this, you'd be like, oh, this person might have a clue as to what they were doing. Either that or they just know how to write sources and citations. But that is where you would actually look for them. And then they will sync back and forth. One thing I want you to note though, sometimes when they sync up, they get cut off, but they're still okay in your family tree maker. I always use family tree maker as my, um, is where I keep everything that I really care about. So that is where your sources and citations are. And then once you get them written, then you can just cut and paste them all over again. Now, there are all sorts. I mean, like I said, this book is like, it's, it's 900 pages. It's an inch and a half thick. Everything you source has many different variations. There's all sorts of different ways to do it. I suggest that you start practicing with the census records because they have a very defined format. It's actually pretty easy. And when you go back and forth, I mean, when, once you get them defined, then you can cut and paste and you can put them out there. If you like, I could post to askancestry.com and we could, um, and I can post all the formats I use for all the U.S. censuses, and that might be a useful way for you to get started. There's nothing wrong with using somebody else's cheat sheet to help you get started. And then if you have questions on how you source different things, we can, there are different ways we could address this. I could do another session on this, and we could maybe spend a session just on passenger records and immigration records, because they have their own 
uniqueness to them. Or we could do um, exactly how you source things that you find on different sites. Find a Grave is a great resource. How do you source those things? Because it's really nice to be able to source them so you can go back and find them. Um, things you find on Family Search, all these kind of things. So if you're interested, we can do more presentations on this. If not, I can continue to put them up in the Ask Ancestry End column. Because I think you, once you get into the habit of doing this, you will find you understand the information in these sources a lot more. And then you will be able to use them better when you're, make, when you're trying to understand what was going on in your ancestors' lives. It really, if you take a little time and slow down a little bit and document what it is that you're doing and where it came from, you'll be amazed at how much more you understand and how much easier it is. Okay. I really, really hope that this presentation has been useful. And I just want you to remember that, you know, why you want to do this. It's not so you can look smart. It's not so you can impress other people. It's so you can find the source again if you need it. And so you can evaluate the quality of the source when you have conflicting evidence. We always know we're going to have conflicting evidence. There's all sorts of records out there and not everything just comes together nicely. I mean, how do we, how do we, um, you know, how many different records have you seen birthplaces for, right? And birth dates for, and a lot of them conflict. How do you decide which one is right? And you do that by looking at the actual record. All right. Somebody asked me where I, where you find Ancestry, and I'll show you that here in a second. Upcoming events that we've got going on. On July 23rd, which is next Monday, they are doing a behind the scenes on Ancestry DNA. That will be great. I recommend that highly. Krista's got four more things coming up. Exploring Roots Web. Lots of good information out on Roots Web. Introduction to Land Records. She has a tweet chat. And she has splitting or combining family trees. And if you've got FTM, you should check that out. Um, I will, one of the, uh, this, uh, the presentation I did last week was on collaboration. I'm a little bit behind on the wiki tree information. I promise I'd send out to some of you. Um, and some of you thought that it was an organization presentation. I'm going to try and schedule that for August. And there seems to be... Uh, a desire for more of this so let's see if we can't schedule another one of these and we will do um, another presentation let's see Leanne you said it would really help I have found a gossip column from my great-grandfather in railroad newsletters owned by the New York Public Library I have no idea how to source this that sounds fun all right so yes um, let me, I will go over and I will post this basic information in askancestry.com. And here's how you get there. No, that is the wrong window. There we go. So, the URL for that. Is ancestry dash sticky notes dot tumblr dot com and over there you will see an ask ancestry in I can also post the link to that in the little comment on the Facebook thing that we usually put up afterwards so and um, I will go through and I will um, put my templates up there for the censuses and you all can make requests for other things that you might like some help sourcing with I know this is tough once you get started but the more you work with it, it can actually be a fun little puzzle Anyways, I have enjoyed talking to you about this today. I'm just so excited. We've had so many people that were interested in this. I think this is great. It's, it just really is wonderful how seriously you guys all take this and how you really want to get your ancestors' lives right. It's really wonderful. All right. I will talk to you all next time. Thanks for joining.